What's going on everybody? Walt here for Overkill Projects and hot on the heels of tearing apart my key light, the Sakani X60. Today I'm going to be tearing apart my audio recorder, which is a Zoom H5 handy recorder. Apparently I'm a glutton for a punishment, taking apart all the stuff that I actually rely on to make these videos, but I think it'll be an interesting teardown. So let's just hope that the rebuild goes as well as the teardown. And now before we get started, I just wanna remind you that if you like the video today, make sure you give it the thumbs up, it really helps the channel, subscribe down there, uh, comment down below, and make sure you check the description. I'm gonna have some data sheets and other stuff linked in down there. Now let's get to it. This is the Zoom H5 Handy Recorder. It is pretty amazing and feature packed. At its best, it can record in 24-bit 96 kilohertz, which I will explain a little bit later in another video. But for now, it's enough to say that it is pretty much overkill for this channel, but it's really great. It leaves you a lot of room and pose to do stuff. It's really great for like run and gun interviews, so news teams, stuff like that. It has interchangeable microphones through these little microphone module units that you can buy separately. And it comes with a dual microphone little stereo module as the default. But you can actually get like shotgun mics and condenser mic modules to add on to this thing afterwards. It also features a super Super simple menu system that I like a lot and you can actually get a remote for this thing so you can handle it without knocking into it and making a bunch of noise. It also has two balanced XLR inputs which is pretty phenomenal uh, and those both can supply phantom power to your microphone. It also has line out and headphone jacks for external monitoring as well as a mini USB port for external power and also so you can transfer files without having to remove the SD card although that's very slow so I rarely actually use that feature. And on the front of the unit you can see we just have the gain controls for the channel one and two mics, the channel selectors, as well as the record button and the playback buttons. Enough of the features and onto the actual unit, you can see that the microphone module comes right off. And it looks like there's not a ton going on here. You can see that there are three exposed screws on the back of the unit, as well as the two exposed screws on the top on the microphone mount. And then there are four screws that are sort of hidden underneath the rubber feet that are also on the bottom of the unit. So once you pull out those little feet and undo those screws, the back comes right off and we are in like a dirty shirt. You can see right away that this thing is very well engineered. There's some shielding around the inside. There's tape holding down all the connectors so they don't go wiggling loose. Things fit together very tightly, but there's enough room to sort of see what's going on. So yeah, all in all, a really beautiful job on the inside of this unit, which is as expected. Getting the back panel off is as simple as removing the speaker and battery connectors. Now looking at the microphone mount, you can see that there's actually two screws buried inside against the case. So I'm gonna have to take those out in order to get the top board out. And you can see that I actually take the ribbon cable out from the microphone mount, but that's totally unnecessary and uh, you don't have to do that if you're taking this apart unless you need to access the microphone mount directly. So now we can go one board at a time. If we were looking at the unit, this is actually the back of the bottom board or you know, now that we take the back off, this is the first thing that you see when you look inside the unit. And now since the larger connector in the middle of this board is for the XLR inputs, we actually expect to see the amplification stages for those two inputs. And that's exactly what we see here. And now if you check the description, I'll link in all the data sheets for the important ICs that we find on this board. And we can see a few of those right now. We can see that each XLR input gets its own NJM2068, which is a low noise amplifier that's specifically designed to be sort of an audio preamp. And actually a lot of the amplification units you're gonna see in here are made by New Japan Radio Company, who makes really nice little sort of audio amplifier units. And now right next to those, we actually see a couple of 74 series logic ICs. Those are 4051 analog muxes, demuxes, whatever you wanna do. Those are gonna work sort of like traffic control. They're just gonna take our analog signal that's come in and cleaned up and then point it in the right direction so that it goes to the right place. And the other circuitry that you see to the right of those ICs is actually for the power input stuff, which a lot of the back of the board will probably also be as well. And that's because the power connector to the batteries is actually the connector that you see right there. And if we move down to the other connector on the other side of the board, we run into another IC, which is the TLV320 DAC 3101. And since you see DAC in the title, you know that this is a digital to audio converter. And actually even better, this is a pretty pretty sweet little unit. It's a DAC that actually has a class D amplifier built in. So what this thing is going to
gonna do is it's going to take a digital signal from the controller and then convert it to an analog signal, which is then going to amplify and output that signal to the speakers, which connect right there on that connector that you see next to the IC. And that's pretty sweet because it saves parts by not needing an extra external amplifier in order to amplify the analog signal for the speakers. You can see here, and as we move on, there are dozens of labeled test points all over the place. The only other thing that's really of note on this side of the board is this IC that's right next to the microphone module mount connector. And it's another New Japan radio company op amp. You can see that it says 100 on it. I'm pretty sure though, that if you look very closely, there's a ghosted two on there because they don't make an amplifier that's numbered 100, but they do make an amplifier that has the number 2100. And so I'm fairly positive that that's actually an NJM 2100 uh, op amp, which is just yet another sort of like low noise op amp for audio applications in small devices like this. And now removing this first board so we can take a look at the other side is actually pretty easy. There's just one uh, multi-pin connector that sort of connects the two things and then, you know, it's held in place by the mount. So you sort of just have to slip your finger in there and, uh, and you can sort of, you know, leverage it out. And now this side of the board is interesting. It's where a lot of the magic happens. Really, when you think about this device, what it is, is one big analog to digital converter. The whole point of this device is to take in an analog signal, which is, you know, audio. It's either my voice or some sort of musical instruments or something like that, and then convert that analog signal to digital and then store that digital signal on an SD card. So really everything in this device should happen in a couple phases. The first thing that's gonna happen is we'll have some sort of audio preamplification, which is just cleaning up the audio signal before it gets to the analog to digital converters. And that's what we saw on the other side of the board. Now on this side of the board, we actually have the ADCs, the analog digital converters. And those are two AKM 5357E ADCs. AKM is a company that makes some pretty spectacular little audio ADCs. You can get a whole bunch of different ones. And each of these units is two channel. They're kind of meant for like stereo input. So we have a four input device and each of these ADCs has two channels. So of course it's, you know, four channels total, just as we expect. And so really most of the specs for the internals of this unit come from this data sheet, the data sheet for the ADCs. And part of my reason for this teardown in the first place is that there's a new spate of 32 bit recording devices that have hit the market lately. And I suspect that those are pretty much just front ends for AKM's 32 bit ADCs. So I was kind of curious to know if it would be possible to put together my own 32-bit recording device, maybe make a video out of that later on down the road. But since so far this pretty much just seems to follow the application recommendations from the data sheets for all the different ICs, it's not an impossible quest. And before you move on, you can actually see that this board actually has yet another audio op amp, the NJM4580 that you can see sort of in the middle of the screen there, as well as another piece of 7.4 series logic from TI, which is just a 7407 six channel buffer. And now before we move on, let's take a look at the microphone module. You can actually see on the inside, it's kind of funny. The circuit board that attaches to the microphones actually has its markings written in, I think, Chinese, whereas the board on the other side that actually connects to the mount has its markings written in Roman characters with abbreviations that obviously come from English. And you can see that the board that connects to the mount actually has another one of those NJM4580 op amps connected to it, which means that the 4580 that was in the unit itself is probably for the two XLR inputs, while this one just handles the input from the microphone on the module. And on the microphone side, we see the NJM2100 again being used as an audio preamp. And so in terms of actual workflow, we can see that what we expect here is that the audio signal comes in gets pre-amplified by the NJM2100 and then somehow cleaned up by the NJM4580 before it's sent on to the ADC, which is the AK5357. And now back to the actual unit, in order to access the next board, you can see that we're gonna have to remove the little copper shielding strip that connected the top board, as well as the XLR input connectors so that we can remove the actual XLR connectors themselves and get access to this board. But once we do that, you can see that there's really not much going on on this board. The only thing that's really here here is a voltage regulator. It's actually the NJM2846, which is also made by New Japan Radio. And that's just here to regulate the 3.3 volts that the other side of this board is probably going to need for its various power rails. 
So now looking at the other side of this board, we see that's where the actual SD card connector is, and it's also where the LCD attaches to the unit. And of course that's expected because you can also see the microcontroller down in the corner. And so that's the thing that's actually going to manage sending all the different signals to the places that, you know, they need to be sent. And you can see in close up that this side of the board features a few different voltage regulation devices. You can see here the Richtech RT9971, which is actually a seven channel power management IC. So this thing is gonna output most of the voltages that we need to operate the various stuff that we see on this board. And we can see from the data sheet that it's pretty much made for two AA battery applications. You can see in the typical application circuit that it actually is meant to output something like a 3.3 volt channel, a five volt channel, a 15 volt channel, a negative seven volt channel, as well as a handful of other little accessory rails for things like LEDs or you know whatever else you might have hooked up. Other than that, this board doesn't feature a ton. There is an IC that's right next to the SD card holder, which I'm assuming is actually some sort of SD card uh, dedicated IC. And then we can see the microcontroller, which actually has a marking on it. I think it says 101G or C. AA, but of course I expect that to be some sort of like custom marking made by Zoom. I don't know if they roll their own chips or if this is just, you know, an off the shelf microcontroller that they have rebranded, you know, internally so that it's sort of like, you know, they're they're hiding whatever controller they're using. And there you pretty much have the teardown. The front of this thing only has the uh, control buttons. So that's not very interesting to look at, which leaves us with the scariest part of any teardown, which is the reassembly. Luckily, this thing, like I said, is extremely well engineered. Uh, it pretty much just uses one type of screw for almost every screw on the entire unit, except for the ones that secure the little protection bar that's in front of the gain dials. So putting it back together amounts to just reversing the steps that we use to take it apart. And so getting everything tightened down, popping the microphone module back in and turning it on, we see that indeed it works. And I did not break one of my favorite pieces of recording equipment and I can keep making content on this channel. Woohoo! And that'll do it, a successful teardown and rebuild of the Zoom H5 Handy Recorder. I am very relieved that it went well. I really like this recorder and uh, I would have been very upset if something had actually happened to it. So I hope you enjoyed yourself today because I sure did. And if you did, make sure you leave a thumbs up down below. Uh, subscribe, you know where the button is for that. Uh, leave a comment down below. Make sure you check the description for data sheets and other information pertinent to what you just saw today. And thanks for joining me. I'll see you next time.